In our review of the 1934 events in yesterday's session, we stopped with the settlement of the second of the general truck driver's strikes along toward the end of August. As I mentioned, one of the provisions of the settlement was the holding of a collective bargaining election under the supervision of the National Labor Relations Board in order to verify the support that the union had among the rank and file workers in the industry. After what I described yesterday, I don't think I need to explain why Local 574 won that election hands down and thereby climbed over the last of the hurdles to recognition of the union on the job. And the problem then became one of consolidating the union gains and preparing for the establishment of job control. A second event took place shortly thereafter, another election, this time inside the Union. The actual leaders of the strike, who had functioned in an unofficial manner, within the framework of a setup in which the old executive board remained the formal leadership, naturally challenged the old executive board for office. You'll recall that at the outset, at the beginning of 1934, a majority of the old executive board had been trying to keep the coal yard workers and their Trotskyist leaders out of the union entirely. Through the opening provided by the collaboration of Brown and Prozig, two members of the board, the cadre out of the coal yards got in and set in motion the process whereby the real leadership was created through the device, the informal device of the organizing committee that pushed the old executive board into the background. Now in this election inside the union, the actual but unofficial leadership that had been established in the strikes displaced the old executive board in a landslide vote. In fact, the whole thing was something like stripping the withered husk off of a fully ripened ear of corn. Everything was ready for the change. And now the stage was set for the consolidation of the Union. Before we go into that, it might be useful to strike a brief balance sheet on the post-strike situation. Here is a battle that had been led by fighters who were the central leaders, were red-baited out of the AF of L in earlier times. They had broken through the bureaucratic obstacles of the craft union setup 
They had mobilized the seemingly passive workers as class warriors and had led them to victory in three successive strikes. In the process, a dynamic union had been built based on class struggle policies that were understood and accepted and welcomed and practiced by the rank and file of the union. And Local 574 had, in fact, emerged from the second of the general driver strikes as a major power in the whole Minnesota labor movement. The new leadership formed a staff from among the most capable and tested leaders that had emerged in action and been tested in fire during the strike struggles. Now this staff lived on peanuts, not because a principle was made of that in an inordinate sense, but because of the circumstances in which the union found itself. By and large, our policy with regard to the wages of staff members in the union followed the initial example laid down in the Paris Commune. Clear back in the, in the uh, previous century and elaborated on by Engels and Lenin particularly in a later period. The idea that leaders of workers' organizations and leaders of the workers' power should receive a wage or a salary no greater than that of the highest paid workers at the most. This concept was inculcated into the union from the outset. But as a matter of fact, the staff had to do even more poorly than that for quite a time. The union had a big accumulation of unpaid strike expenses. As you recall, we had a good many casualties during the strike. And this entails some substantial hospital bills. And by and large, we were able to get credit from the hospitals during the strike, but the union had to make good its obligations. We had to buy certain bulk groceries, meats, beyond what we could get donated from friendly merchants who were constrained to be helpful toward the union because the working class were their customers. Here again, we were able to get credit. Now, the union had to make good on these obligations because the poorest thing in the uh, world that the union could afford to do would get the immediate image of, uh, of freeloaders. And so uh, a substantial part of the current resources of the union had to be used for this purpose. And then we had to begin making payments on accumulated unpaid per capita tax to Tobin. We had a, a monthly dues of a dollar and sixty cents, a little lower than it is on the average today. And Tobin got 30 cents of that every month. He didn't deserve it. It was kind of like uh, paying blackmail, but it was part of the price of trying to have peace with this old craft union reactionary at the top of the international. We didn't have the money to pay it all off at once, but we immediately formally notified the international that we acknowledged our debt and began making payments and hoped that they would show, well, maybe just a thimble full of the milk of human kindness. Well, as you'll see, he didn't. But what did the poet say? Hope springeth eternal in the human heart. 
Another thing that made the union's financial circumstances very difficult was that the members were stripped financially during the long struggle. And no matter how ready and willing they were, here you've got a body of workers, the great majority of whom have got families, and they've been accumulating their own personal debts, and their kids' clothes have been getting ragged, and there's, they're putting cardboard in the soles of the kids' shoes and one thing or another, and first thing's got to come first. Now the war is won, the kids of the strikers is one of the first things got to have attention. So in these circumstances, the staff of the union, again, led by example, as it had tried to do all the way through the strike battles, and, it was to con as, and as it was to continue to do in all things thereafter, in the functioning of the union. Now it's a very important fact Leaders can't take special rights and privileges and yet expect devoted response from a membership. There cannot be two classes of citizenship in any organization. And anyone who says, well, a leader thinks, all right, that's what he's supposed to do. And if he doesn't want to carry the responsibilities of a leader, let him go get in a telephone booth and take the receiver off the hook and do his thinking where he won't be interrupted. And don't get in the way of, of building up struggle organizations of the working class. And time after time, the membership of Local 574 responded in the fullest measure to this example set by the leaders and tried to practice it. The strike committee of 100 that I described to you, both as to its nature and as to some of its functions in the course of battle, became transformed into an instrument for union control on the job through the mechanism of the job stewards. Now, even then, stewards were not an uncommon thing. But that only says half. The other half is this was a very unusual steward body because it was made up of the best of the fighters, the most devoted of the union members as they had been tested and selected and educated in the heat of battle across that long, hot summer of 1934. These stewards took the lead on the job with the backing of the members in policing the union contract as it then existed and crowding everything to its outer limits in order to prepare in life during the course of that contract the basis for the next one that would be an even better one. They enforced general union control on the job. And the stewards knew they had the union power solidly behind them. And they knew this doubly because one thing that union always did under Trotsky's leadership was retain at all times, in all circumstances, the unconditional right to strike. There was never a whisper of a no-strike pledge. Never an agreement that we wouldn't even strike during the life of contract. Bosses would raise this argument, we'd say, what do you mean, you don't intend to live up to the contract? Is that why you're anxious for us to tell you in advance we won't strike? We got grievances? You just sign on the dotted line, and so long as you live up to the contract, we'll guarantee you, you won't have a strike. If you start to chisel, we'll guarantee you, you'll get one so fast it'll make your head spin. And that was the policy of the Union under the Trotskyist leadership all the way through. And through this process, the Union was able to develop what became at least a limited application of the concepts of workers' control of production. And we could do this because we had licked the bosses in a civil war 
and trained a magnificent cadre of Union fighters in the process who had a class-conscious leadership. But before we could exercise this power to the maximum, we had to cross swords with Tobin. In the spring of 1935, Tobin revoked the charter of Local 574. He used as a pretext the fact we hadn't paid up all our back per capita tax. But that was the good reason, it wasn't the real reason. He set up by the single act of the stroke of a pen at his roll top desk in his antiquated headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana, another local union called Local 500 to which he assigned the jurisdiction that had been won in battle by Local 574. He proclaimed Local 574 outlawed from the labor movement and instructed one and all to deal only with his paper local. Now what it meant was that Tobin and the bureaucrats down through all the echelons were hoping that things were getting back to normal for them. They were eager to clean out the radicals, house break the union and have a nice dues bonanza for themselves. And here again they were showing the limited, petty, narrow, warp mentality of a union bureaucrat that's got so damn much fat between his ears that there's no room for ideas to percolate through, even, even with the magnificent electronic instruments of the day. It hasn't been accomplished yet. It's a bigger problem than atomic fission ever dreamed of being. <laughs> <laughs> they had the notion that form settles everything, and Tobin thought all he had to do was tear up this page in his record that said that the, the IBT charter belonged to Local 574, and that meant we were out. It didn't work out that way, of course. The bosses, the newspapers, and the politicians, reformists and conservative alike, were all in favor of this bureaucratic move on Tobin's part. As a matter of fact, almost coincident with the revocation of the charter of the local union, a rank and file member of the union, a fellow by the name of Happy Holstein, was indicted for, for murder on the grounds that he was the killer of the two special deputies down in the market in May of 1934. He was brought to trial. The frame up nature of the charge was so obvious that the defense was able to secure a unanimous verdict of the jury of not guilty and that ended that attempt. The bosses, meantime, are lending themselves to all possibility of signing sweetheart contracts with Local 500. In case you're not familiar, it's a terminology that developed many years ago in the uh, union movement that when a labor faker gets together with the boss behind closed doors, and the boss says, oh, I'm going to be generous with you. I'll sign a clause that says all your workers got to pay you dues. And then he says to the boss, well, fair is fair. So you tell me what you want to pay, and I'll sign a contract that sets your rate. The workers just summed it all up by calling it a sweetheart contract, a very, <laughs> a, a very expressive term. And the bosses were trying to sign this kind of contracts with Local 500. And they were beginning to pour it on us from all directions until one day... Bill Brown and a little, he had a little uh, column in the organizer. It was a little box, and the title of it was Bill Brown Says. He would come up with little epigrams. And uh, we had continued the organizer after the strike, no longer as a daily, less frequent publication, but we continued all the way through to 1949, publishing the organizer, usually on a, uh, on a monthly basis, sometimes on a weekly basis in critical situations. Uh, Brown put this little, uh, little item in his box. He says, nobody likes the leaders of 574 except the truck driver. 
And that was what was decisive. Now, the problem for the bureaucrats was principally and primarily that objective conditions were still running against them. The victory of Local 574 had precipitated a general worker upsurge throughout town, and workers were flooding into the unions from all quarters. And in every instance, they were looking to the outlaws of Local 574 for leadership. This was tested in proven merchandise, and, and they, wanted, they wanted to get some of it. We helped everybody as best we could. We applied the industrial union criteria in organizing into 574. That is, we took everybody into the union who was in or around the trucking industry and in any way, shape, or form, or if there was somebody that nobody else wanted, we took them too. Everybody was entitled to have a home. But we were careful to avoid raiding the jurisdictions of other unions, even though sometimes that meant we had to honor craft criteria that were not fundamentally in the best interest of building the strongest possible union movement. But we had to be careful not to have a fight on too many fronts at the same time. And if we had begun raiding the jurisdictions of other unions, rank, the rank and file of some unions where the bureaucrats were against us would also have, have tended to be against it. But as it was, even though the bureaucrats were against us in most of the unions, conversely, the ranks everywhere were for us. And it helped to promote general sympathy to 574 in the fight against Tobin. Then, Parallel with this, Local 574 began to take a direct hand in organizing the unemployed. We began to introduce the concept, the criteria of the responsibility of the union movement for the organization of the unemployed workers and for fighting on behalf of the unemployed workers. Here we applied a different jurisdictional criteria. We'd take an unemployed worker under the wing of Local 574 no matter where he had been, in what industry, or under the jurisdiction of what union when he had a job. And here, among other things, we outflanked the Communist Party in the contest for leadership of the unemployed movement in Minneapolis by developing what after a period of time evolved into what was known as the Federal Workers Section of Local 574. And here we had special arrangements. They weren't, they weren't formal members of the union in the same sense the truck drivers were. They were a sort of an auxiliary section to the union that uh, didn't have the same formal rights that the, that the full members employed in the industry where the Euro union had its jurisdiction retained, but they got the full benefit of the power of the union in, in the fight to improve their plight. The union set up here a full-dress grievance apparatus, and we took on City Hall, we took on the state capitol, we took on the federal government, we took on every one of the agencies in the whole uh, relief and made work setup of the New Deal at that time to fight the grievances of the unemployed. It was a very common thing. We'd get a phone call. Some deputy sheriff is out at a worker's house, unemployed, going to evict him. And we developed, in these conditions, the counterpart of the flying squadrons that we had used during the, uh, during the, uh, the uh, strikes. And we could get a, a, a detachment out on 10 minutes' notice, any place in town, to stop a deputy sheriff from evicting an unemployed worker from his, from his home for non-payment of rent. And don't forget, these deputy sheriffs weren't too tough when 574 showed up because this is only months after they've seen what happened to the regular cops <laughs> down in the market and, and uh, they weren't too anxious to get tough. As a matter of fact, in a few instances, the 
the Union even adopted children. You still have today that heinous practice that existed then and existed long before that, where these idle women's busy hour clubs of the rich who are going to do good for humanity, so they form some kind of a human aid society and they attach themselves as an auxiliary of the, of the relief department and they start sticking their long snouts into the personal lives of people that can't get a job and are looking for relief. And one of the things they do is try to take children away from parents on the grounds either the child was born out of wedlock or if these people can't support themselves they ought to know better than to have children and since they don't know better than to have children so they don't since they don't know how to feed them they shouldn't be allowed to have children and so they're going to take them away and the union began to step in and adopt these children one of the officers one of the jobs we had more foster fathers and foster mothers around there but we stopped more of these idle women's busy hour clubs from wrecking working class homes this way than happened in any other city. And that didn't make enemies for Local 574 and the working class, I can tell you that. Later on, after the WPA was developed, we, we heightened the union concept and made a battle for recognition of a WPA union and demanded fixed wage rates from the WPA and they refused and a strike was called. And it was quite a strike. And a framework occurred here. There's a law that had been passed under the New Deal, if I remember rightly, it was called the Woodruff Law. It said you couldn't strike against the government. After the, the strike was successful in that, in that we, we gained some very substantial improvements for the WPA workers, but after the strike, the leadership of the strike, including two or three of our comrades, were framed up under this Woodruff Law for striking against the government, sentenced to, and had to serve a couple of years in the federal pokey. But nevertheless, something was being taught to the working class here. New power, new momentum is being developed. And in some, the union policy solidarized the employed and the unemployed in a way that ought to be happening today and is going to happen today, but the pressure's got to get, or is going to happen soon, I should say, but the pressure's got to get a little greater and there's got to be a few changes made in the union leadership before it can be accomplished. The general struggle trends, in other words, were continuing in our favor. Local 574 was growing steadily in numbers, in influence, and in power. And Local 500, our rival, created full, born out of the head of Daniel J. Tobin, remained an impotent paper set. So Tobin decided to give us the Chicago treatment. I mean no offense to you citizens of Chicago, but if you know a little of the background of labor history around here, you'll know what I mean by the Chicago treatment. If you don't, you'll know when I get done describing to you how they tried to apply it up there. He sent in a gang of case-hardened bureaucrats out of the Teamsters movement here in Chicago and some outright hoodlums. They were made the officials of Local 500. Their method of operation was to prowl the streets, the team tracks, the loading docks with guns and blackjacks and the benevolent protection of the police, go around and threaten and conjole the bosses and look for sweetheart contracts, play footsie and get support from every two-bit politician around town, and in general, try to cut the throat of the rank and file of 574 from here to here. And they were aided in this by a special representative that William Green, the president of the American Federation of Labor, sent in to give the full blessing of the AFL to it. But we refused to let this gang from Chicago make it a gang fight between this engrafted 
staff of case-hardened bureaucrats and hoodlums in Local 500 and the staff of Local 574. We refuse to let them pick the battleground or choose the weapons. We fought, rather, by involving the whole membership of the Union in picketing in some instances, demonstrations in others, always on the basis of legitimate Union interests with the rank and file fully involved, instead of the rank and file sitting like spectators in an old Roman circus watching the lions eat the Christians. This went on from the early spring of 1936 to about midsummer. Finally, we came to a showdown, a little outfit called the Chippewa Spring Water Company that specialized in delivering bottled water to offices and one thing or another like that. This a boss has always been hard to get along with. At an earlier time before this, he had tried to, to break the contract and when we put the arm on him, he threatened to move his business out of town. We asked him, how are you going to get that well out of the ground? He'd get the well out of the ground, and we would take seriously <laughs> this threat of his to leave town. He never got the well out of the ground, so we said, well, <laughs> you either pay up or close up. But now, he was a natural to try to go along with Local 500. So he signed a contract with them. And they informed the men in such a way that they were sure we would get to know it that effective as of a certain morning, they were going to stop oper start operating under Local 500, and Local 500 was going to give the workers protection, and anybody who didn't want this could quit because he was out of a job. Well, on the appointed morning, it was about sunrise, Local 574 showed up in force. The goons from Chicago were there. The cops were there. And it was a rather tense situation. And then finally the boss got the jitters. All this stuff is is peddled in bottles, you know. And I guess he suddenly <laughs> started thinking about what people that live in glass houses shouldn't do. And uh, he said, well, we'll have to work out something here. And the upshot of it was that... Uh, a subcommittee from Local 574 and a subcommittee from Local 500 met there right on the loading dock and agreed to have a formal meeting the following day between the two unions to negotiate the possibilities of a permanent truce. In short, it was the beginning of the capitulation by Tobin the attempt he'd made to throw us out of the labor movement. Now I should point out that always at all times we related the local to the national situation. We had no illusions that Local 574 could go indefinitely declared outlaw. It was because an isolated local can't stand forever against an organized national machine. In fact, not long after Tobin revoked our charter, we tried to get a charter from John L. Lewis. This was in the middle of 1935, after Lewis had slugged Hutchison of the Carpenters at the 1934 convention, and the CIO was just gestating. It hadn't come to full form yet, but it was gestating. Well, Lewis didn't see his way clear to have anything to do with us at that time, so we had to do the best we could. But our isolated position was an important factor in our minds, in deciding to make peace with Tobin if we could get some kind of a compromise under which we could live and not give away anything in principle. Now, you'll see this same problem will appear again in, similar, in, uh, in, in different form tomorrow night when we talk about the 1941 fight. But what I want to make clear is that all the way through, while we didn't hesitate to take action, set tone, and do everything we could do at the local level, we never got the notion that you could act in one town as though that town was the beginning and the end of the national complex. It's known as the United States of America, which has many diverse uh, uh, social uh, forces in one and another stage of conflict and political gestation within it. <coughs>
Now, there were hesitations in the party about our taking the, the negotiated settlement that we did take. The hesitations were not because, and, and I mean hesitations on the part of very serious commerce in the party, not kibitzers like those that accused the, the commerce in the coal yards a year before of practicing company unionism. I mean serious commerce. There were hesitations as to whether or not uh, we should make the compromise that we made with Tobin in, in arriving at a truce, not because the commerce didn't recognize we couldn't go forever in local situation, but because there was some concern as to whether or not we could survive under the compromise. And the question was then, well, maybe it might be better to just go ahead and fight as best you can. All right, yes, maybe you'll lose, but it's better to lose than it is to let yourself get compromised. But in the last analysis, whether or not we could make the compromise work turned on the consciousness, the caliber, of the party cadre in Minneapolis. And the party cadre in Minneapolis was solid in the belief that we could swing it in a satisfactory way for the party. And the comrades of the party then gave us the benefit of the doubt and we went ahead. Now, to uh, give you an exact feel of the compromise, let me first uh, just describe briefly the nature of the leadership structure of a truck driver's union. Uh, central to the local union structure is an executive board of seven. This executive board is made up of the president, the vice president, a recording secretary, the secretary treasurer, and three trustees. And the executive board and officers in the compromise we reached lined up as follows. One post, the post of president, was set aside from either Local 574 or Local 500, and the allocation was to a man by the name of Pat Corcoran, who was the head of the Teamsters Joint Council, the parent body in the town of all the local unions. And he was supposed to be the outside impartial man in what was to be a, an equal representation between Local 574 and Local 500 on the executive board. Local 500 got three board members, Local 574 got three board members. On top of that, they insisted on the key post, the post of secretary treasurer. This gives them the two key posts in the union, the president through Corkin of the joint council and the, and the uh, secretary treasurer post through the head of the Local uh, 500 contingent. Now, formally, we were in a minority, and we were in a secondary position from the point of view of the, of the formal authority of the various posts in the Union, and therefore, on the surface, we were subject to a squeeze. And it wasn't an unimportant thing to consider, but there were more important facts, namely, the membership was with the 574 leaders. You had in part now a return to the situation prior to the election after the strike when the real leadership was the unofficial organizing committee and you had a formal executive board alongside of it that had the official name but didn't have the real authority. Second, we had a strong and battle-tested leading cadre in the staff of the union and all the way through the membership. And third, the class struggle was still unfolding. We contended on that ground that what was involved here was a test of formal posts against actual leadership authority that we said we felt in our bones we could prove would work out just exactly as it had worked out in 1934 during the course of the general strikes. <laughs> now, 
As in getting into 574 in the first place, when we look for a crack in the bureaucracy, this is the first thing we look to in this situation. And we thought we saw the crack in Corcoran of the Teamsters Joint Council, who in fact, in what is to happen now in the fusion of Local 500 and Local 574, played a role closely comparable to that that Brown had played when the coal drivers under Trotsky's leadership were breaking their way into Local 574 in the first place. Corcoran was not as able a man as Brown, but he had many of Brown's characteristics. He was essentially an honest man by his lights. A revolutionist wouldn't call him selfless. You would be critical of some of the personal ambitions he showed, but all things are relative. Uh, if you've got to choose between eating a lizard and a goat, a goat looks pretty good, although you'd rather have a T-bone steak. And similarly, uh, while Corcoran wasn't a shining example of, uh, of everything a labor leader ought to be compared to a revolutionist, he was well above the average from the point of view of, of the run-of-the-mine uh, union bureaucrats. And like Brown, he had a little vision. And he had a little capacity to try new things, to try to do some union building work in a bigger way than he had ever found possible. He was out of the milk wagon drivers union. That was his, lo his local union, but he was the head of the Teamsters Joint Council. He had been inspired by the battles of 1934 and impressed with the potential in struggle along that line. And finally, again, he had that very precious commodity guts. Now, we proceeded along this line to utilize the positive sides of Corcoran with a view toward making a change in which what had started formally as a four to three vote against us, the assumption being that Corcoran would vote with the local 500 gang, into a four, four to three majority on the 574 side. And across a period of time, we succeeded. And it didn't take too long. The first showdown and a decisive one came when we caught two of the hoodlums that had come up with the Chicago gang, and we had to agree they'd be put on the staff. We caught them taking dough from the bosses. Caught them hands down. And we demanded they be fired from the staff and Corcoran voted with us. It was four to three right straight down the line. And after that, it was just a question of, of mopping up. As a matter of fact, to overleap for a moment, in the fall of 1937, Corcoran was murdered. Shot in the head as he was, he just put his car in his garage at home and was walking from the garage to the house and he was shot in the head. The murder was never solved. But there always was a belief around among many informed people in the union quarters that this showdown that I just described to you in which we cleaned some of the hoodlums out of the staff uh, had something to do with it. Nobody can prove it, but it hasn't been disproven either, you might say. Uh, about six months after Corcoran was murdered, Brown was. Brown was found in his automobile one morning, sitting behind the wheel. He'd been shot in the head and was slumped down. His murder, too, was unsolved. Not necessarily uh, having the same connotations as, uh, as uh, Corcoran's. Uh, there was one of the members of the union who said he had done it. As a matter of fact, he was brought to trial. He was found not guilty, and it's an open question as to whether or not it was one of these people with a certain psychic imbalance, you know, that will come around and testify to something. It is not at all certain that the man that was brought to trial really did it. We don't know. But there were these two murders that, that, that occurred in a sequence of six months. In connection with this, the leader 
of the Chicago group that had come in pulled out. We think that it was the circumstances behind the Corcoran murder that caused him to do it. And when he pulled out, then the whole leadership uh, was structure was reorganized, and to all practical intents and purposes, things were restored to the status they were before we made the truce, except there was one man in the Chicago gang. He wasn't a hoodlum. He came from that category that up to then had been a case-hardened bureaucrat. He stayed. He remained. He became like our men on the Union staff. He became a close sympathizer of the party. He, was in, he stayed with us in the fight with Tobin in 1941. He was indicted and went to trial with us in 1941. And although he got his own lawyer, he acted in a very principled way and, and in, in complete solidarity with the defense as a whole. And remained, although now out of touch, he remained a sympathizer of the party. As a matter of fact, the head man who pulled out after Corcoran died remained sympathetic to us he died of a heart attack here some years back, but in two presidential campaigns he tossed in ten bucks for the cause. You never know what will happen to people under a uh, given set of circumstances. Now, with the peace made with Tobin, things were brought to a new stage of union growth. We were able to accomplish a very quick mop-up of all the unorganized drivers and, and uh, inside workers in all the Teamster jurisdictions. Shortly thereafter, we were able to play a key role in precipitating and helping to lead to a victorious conclusion, a general truck driver strike in the twin city of St. Paul. And parallel with this, there was a general upsurge of union organization around the area and beginning to radiate out into other communities in the, uh, in the vicinity. And this union growth was beginning to transform the Central Labor Union, the central council of all the AFL unions in town, of which the Truck Drivers Union was a part. I should say, by the way, I'm going to mention Local 544 hereafter. Part of the settlement was what will the number of the new local be? We demanded it be 574. Tobin didn't demand it be 500, but he, he didn't feel he could give us 574. That, that kind of wouldn't be saving face. So he searched through the records and he finally found that nobody had number 544. He says, that's as close as I can get to it. He says, it's two numbers out of the three. Won't you settle for that? <laughs> so we did. So hereafter now, what began as 574 is, is 544. 544 had its representatives in the Central Labor Union. And in this changing situation, a, a, uh, a modified pattern in the leadership structure of the Central Labor Union took place. Uh, through the form of the creation of a special body that was known as a policy committee. It was really an ad hoc committee composed of outstanding leaders from the outstanding unions in the Central Labor Union. And in key matters, it superseded the formal executive committee of the Central Labor Union in the same way our organizing committee had superseded the, the, uh, the actual executive board of the union. Carl Skoglin was our representative on the policy committee and he played a major role in the dual sense that he was a very able spokesman for any union and on top of that, he was the spokesman for the most powerful union in the whole area. And this development gave further impetus to the struggle process, to the wave of unionization in the area. Among other things, as this process is developing, we revived the honorable tradition of labor recognizing May Day. <laughs> 
and in the form of holding a union parade right down through the middle of town. And in that setting, in that time, compared with what the situation had been just a few years before, it was as though either a rejuvenated UAW or Steelworkers Union here in Chicago today was taking the lead in organizing a march down State Street on May Day. This was one of the things that changed the atmosphere. In uh, the latter part of the 30s, one of these crackpot incipient fascists, a man by the name of Dudley Pelly, uh, created a group called the Silver Shirts. And he made a couple of trips out to uh, Minneapolis. He'd heard about this union of wild men out there that had no respect for law and order. <coughs> and called for uh, these unreasonable, unrestrained labor agitators being treated in the only way they could be treated. If the law won't take care of them, an enraged citizenry has to. He was proposing vigilante action. He was talking about raids on the union headquarters and one thing or another. So we formed a union defense guard. Again, using the key figures that had emerged through this whole experience. They were no summer soldiers. They were no militia. They were, they were like the old army of the Potomac. Tough, battle-tested, seasoned. And while we never had to use the defense guard, it served the dual purpose of discouraging any possible adventurous attacks on the Union by any incipient fascist gang, and it brought a new stage of consciousness to the rank and file of Local 544, the concept of worker self-defense. And if you consider that this took place in the historical context of the Spanish Civil War that was raging at that time, where the unions of Spain were contributing some of the main military detachments on the Loyalist side in the form of Union militia, you can, you can see how, how this experience helped to deepen the political class consciousness of the ranks of the Union. Now, there was one other byproduct of the Union Defense Guard. In one of the counts against us in 1941 in the federal trial, where we're supposed to have wanted to overthrow the federal government by force and violence right here and now, they got a stool pigeon to come in and testify that our Union Defense Guard had nothing to do with Dudley Pelly or anything else, that this was the beginning of the creation of the key cadre structure to overthrow the government. In all seriousness, the federal government of the United States of America, under that great liberating uh, human politician of all time, Franklin D. Roosevelt, tried to frame our union because we'd organized a defense guard against a gang of incipient fascist hoodlums. It happened. It happened. <clears throat> now, to move back a little, I'm just taking categories now of some of the main highlights of the experience between 1934 and 41. Let us take a sort of a bird's eye view of the next and final of the major steps in the expansive development of the Union struggle as it stemmed from the fight that opened in Minneapolis in the first instance. And that was the campaign to organize the over-the-road drivers which got underway in 1937. The Union itself, Local 544, was confronted with a problem of over-the-road drivers for freight and chain outfits in that they operated into our terminal where we had a wage rate now way above that of either unorganized terminals around us or terminals where there were weaker unions. 
And we didn't want to practice what was then the Chicago practice. As of that moment in 1937, the Chicago practice, I've got to knock your tower a little tonight, please forgive me. The Chicago practice at that time was over-the-road drivers couldn't come into Chicago unless they belonged to a Chicago union. But all they got was a union button. They had to pay an initiation fee, they had to pay dues, but the union never made any pretense of doing anything for them. They continued to operate under, under uh, open shop conditions, but they had, to pay, they had to pay this tribute, so to speak, to come into Chicago. Now, naturally, we weren't going to institute that kind of a practice. We weren't trying just to collect dues from people, but uh, simultaneously, this, this was a potential threat to undermining the conditions we were establishing for the members of our union that, that uh, drove over the road. And it was a necessity to carry the struggle further to, to uh, defend and improve the condition of the workers caught in a bind that didn't have the benefit of a union like 544. So we formed what was known as the North Central District Drivers Council, radiating out from Minneapolis to terminals in the vicinity, in Upper Wisconsin, Lower Iowa, the eastern part of, uh, of uh, North and South Dakota, and the balance of Minnesota. And in addition to strengthening the existing locals, we began to create new ones. We began to shape regional contracts and began to lift the level of wages and conditions for workers operating throughout the area and strengthening the union movement in the area and setting new fires that precipitated organization drives that went beyond the trucking industry into other spheres of employment in these towns. Along the latter part of 1937, we called a conference which we had conceived of as just for this area. It was held in St. Paul. And frankly, we were amazed by the spontaneous turnout. There were representatives of truck drivers' unions from as far away as Oklahoma that, tur that turned up at that conference. And the second thing that turned up was an international representative of Tobin's. We called him Lobster John Picago, and he deserved the name. And he had in his pocket a telegram from Tobin, this time not or or ordering us to arbitrate, as he had tried to do in May 1934, but ordering us to cease and desist from creating this council of over-the-road drivers. Well, we didn't cease and desist. We just modified our tactics a little and played it a little cool and tried to give... Tobin not any more evidence than he could to use against us while we went, went right ahead doing what we were doing. And finally we developed enough momentum that we were able to call a conference in the spring of 1938 right here in Chicago. It took place in the Milk Wagon Drivers headquarters out on Ashland Boulevard. And at this conference, in addition to the whole area from Minnesota and the Dakotas on down into Arkansas and Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, representatives of the unions came in from Michigan, throughout Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And they wanted to get with it. Well, it was becoming increasingly hard for Tobin to exercise his veto. Then came the decisive act. And here again we have a parallel with the case of Brown and getting into 574 with the, in the case, with the case of Corcoran and resolving the contradictions in the, in the unification of 574 and 500 to create 544. And it was in the person of John T. O'Brien, the head of Local 710 of what was then designated as the meat wagon drivers here in Chicago. Have their headquarters out on Halstead Street opposite what used to be the stockyards. I don't know how much of it exists out there yet, but I don't think it's been years enough yet for the smell to have evaporated. O'Brien was even, he wasn't even as much like Corcoran as Corcoran was like Brown. He was brought up in the Chicago school, but he had again these qualities that permitted his utilization to make the breakthrough. 
Uh, he was able to see the advantage of this situation that we were developing. He was able to get a glimmer of the kind of union power that could be created. And while there's no doubt that what motivated him most was the power the union would have from the point of view of his background concepts of a bureaucratic type of leader, but what was decisive was that he was willing to throw the weight of local 710 in this key situation behind the drive to create this kind of a powerful force throughout the area. A second thing in his favor was that he had very good relations with the general secretary treasurer of the international, the second in command, a man by the name of Tom Hughes, that enabled us to develop pressure on Tobin from a new flank that if he wouldn't help, at least step out of the way and let us see what we could do with this over-the-road organization. And third, and if you notice, I begin to mention it every time, it's because without it, you haven't got much. He had guts. Just speaking about the question of guts from the point of view of any kind of leadership role, it's a pleasure to take a person that's got guts, you know, but got a little rough edges and don't always know how to keep a sense of proportion, do things in balance, or make sometimes even too many mistakes. It's a pleasure to take a person like that and as best you can from the point of view of whatever you may know, help to teach them and train them so that they become a skilled fighter and, uh, and uh, develop into a real leader. But one of the most thankless tasks in this world is to try to put gut into people that haven't got it. I have never seen it accomplished. If you ever hear of it happening, please drop me a line and let me know. So it's no accident that I stress at every instance, when you talk about these key figures, when you're looking for these contradictions with any bureaucracy, to find a, find a crack you can drive through, one of the necessary components has always got to be guts. There's no more lonesome feeling in this life when you're in a, in a fight, and it gets to be a stand-up fight, and to hear the sound of receding footsteps behind you. I don't know a lonelier sound in this life. <clears throat> now, O'Brien was key in another sense. Chicago was then, and it is now, the hub of the trucking industry for this whole vast area around here of what is now known as the Central States Conference of Teamsters, which is just the modern form of the structure we created along the lines I'm going to describe to you now, back in 1938-39. And it had, a, it had a great strategic value because for a great distance around here, either truck lines from other terminals operate direct into Chicago or freight is relayed from a line that operates out of Chicago to them. If you couldn't get them coming right into Chicago, you could get them by stopping the flow of freight to them on the relay when you had the arm on the trucking boss that operated in Chicago. Couldn't get them one way, you got them another. And by the utilization of this power, now that we had local 710, supporting a thing, and we had, we had backing from over in uh, Detroit, down in Fort Wayne, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, and so on, as well as the whole area down through St. Louis, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and so on, out as far as Denver of the West, where we came into the border lands of possible jurisdictional clashes with Dave Beck, with whom we were able to get a certain modus vivendi in that respect. We were able to force centralized negotiations here in Chicago for the over-the-road drivers in an 11-state area around Chicago. We met over here in the Merchandise Mart across the canal. And uh, we got a negotiated settlement without a strike. The bosses knew we had the arm on them. But they thought, they'd heard a little about these wild men from Minnesota, but they thought they knew their men. Here's Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, Kansas City. Uh, well, reason is going to prevail. They were confident they were going to get a class, collaboris, class collaborationist deal out of the situation. And one of the very first things they did was offer a closed shop contract. We said, good, we'll take it. 
And then we started putting in the rest of our demands. And we got a, we got a contract that in one single stroke made a qualitative leap in wages and conditions for tens and tens of thousands of truck drivers wheeling these ten wheel bottoms up and down the highways of this whole area. We did it at the outset just like we started the organization drive that led to the May strike in 1934. We started holding meetings with the rank and file all over the 11 state area. We began bringing drivers in off the trucks and the union would compensate them, put them on full time so they could be on the area committee. We had right on our area committee that was over there in the merchandise mark negotiating with the bosses Guys had just come off the highway trucks and knew exactly what they were talking about. And just like the workers in 1934 knew the industry inside out and knew all the tricks of the bosses. And we got a tremendous power behind us right from the outset through that. Moreover, we confronted in the trucking industry a gang of disorganized bosses. And we confronted them with organized union power. You got the polar opposite between a setup like General Motors or United States Steel and the trucking industry. A big operator in the trucking industry is small fry compared to what real big operators are in, in the basic industries where the giant monopolies exist. The industry before everything else is characterized by its anarchy. And, and the dog-eat-dog -dog practices between the bosses themselves, to say nothing of their mercenary practices and aims and intentions against the workers. And it's one of those situations where, unlike the big corporations, sometimes a boss is glad to join in and help cut another boss's throat because he can't see beyond the end of his nose. He doesn't realize, you know, that he's helping to build a union that's going to make it tougher and tougher for him to exploit his workers. All he sees is that the that the uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend, <laughs> and the union's about to lower the boom on his competitor. Then, and in this kind of a circumstance where the union, union is an organized power, and you've got this disorganized gang of bosses, it, uh, it creates a striking situation in which to begin to impose union control in many respects. And starting that way, we used the strong points radiating out of Chicago as the key weapon to begin to extend and deepen our control. You can't operate into a... No truck can come into a strong terminal unless it conforms to the conditions of the established union contract. You can't come into a strong point Mr. Operator, even if you're paying union wages to your men, if you're relaying freight to another operator beyond our strong points, is paying scab wages. In this way, we just moved out terminal by terminal, and through the central power of the over-the-road drivers, we strengthened the, the local cartage drivers and all the other truck drivers' trades in the town, and... Got a, got a momentum of its own fashion developed in towns that had sometimes been almost completely open shop, something along that, that, the lines of that we developed in 1934 in Minneapolis, which then began to give impetus to organization drives in other spheres. Now, the negotiated settlement that we won in the summer of 1938 was formally certified by Tobin after the event. He had no choice. And it was ratified by a conference of all the local unions in the 11th state area that was held in Indianapolis, Indiana, the headquarters of the International Union. A message was sent over from the general president that he had our blessings. And we went right ahead in the meeting, and we had a discussion and decision and ratification of the contract along the same lines of the description I give you of how we ratified the settlement and the strike in Minneapolis in 1934. It was understood, accepted, ratified by the drivers, and they were ready to enforce it, and they were ready to enforce it, and they were ready to battle for it. And here again, 
we insisted on the unconditional right to strike and to drive the lesson home and try to create a certain mentality among particularly these young men we were taking off of the over-the-road trucks and making organizers in this drive, we developed a few slogans. For instance, instead of saying goodbye, you know, uh, as one of them was leaving after a conference, the last thing you'd say to him is be, now remember, don't arbitrate. Or, because they keep asking, can you do this or can you do that, maybe another time as he's leaving, you'd say, now remember, you can do anything you're big enough to do. Along this line, with just some simple little phrases, uh, I'll admit that it's got just a little of the Madison Avenue touch to it, but at least it was to a useful purpose, even though there is a little subliminal advertising in it. <clears throat> but what, what was at its essence was the concept of workers' power. Don't let the power to decide out of your own hands, and you can do anything you're big enough to do if you know how to mobilize your power and if you've got the intelligence and the guts to use it. That's what we were telling them in the work. By, by slogans of this kind. Now came the war. Within a matter of days, after the ratification conference in Indianapolis, the over-the-road bosses west of the Mississippi began to back off from the contract. They participated in the negotiations, had indicated formal ratification there, and the focal point became Omaha, Nebraska, where all the trucking lines locked out the men. The strike spread from there to Des Moines, to Sioux City, and, and uh, other, uh, other towns in the general area, but the focal point was Omaha. And there's where we joined back. Now just let me note in passing, that we had no sooner gotten engaged in this battle, which became quite a battle out in the West, than the trucking bosses here in the East began to violate the contract, and they began to try to make good on the expectations they had, that they had a good class collaborationist deal, and no matter what the contract said, if when the business agent come to see him, they said, well, geez, you look kind of seedy, don't you think you ought to have a new suit or a new porcelain hat? That, well, he forgot the grievance. Well, this went on while the battle was going on. I just wanted to make a note of it in passing because we're going to come back to that later, too. Omaha was the key point, and on top of everything else, the state of Nebraska had an, an anti-picketing law. The town of Omaha was under the tight control of a central bosses organization that was the counterpart of the Citizens Alliance I described to you in Minneapolis was run by the Union Pacific Railroad. I guess that tells you everything, doesn't it? Well, we laid siege to Omaha like Grant laid siege to Vicksburg. And we captured Omaha like Grant captured Vicksburg. Within the town, we defied the anti-picketing law. There were injunctions, oh, they got injunctions out against us by the dozen. I never mentioned that the judges passed out injunctions every day just like the bosses were taking aspirin during the strike in, in Minneapolis. But all an injunction is is a piece of paper that gives a pseudo-legal justification for a cop trying to part your ears with a club. And when he's already doing that, you're mobilized to fight that, would you care about this piece of paper? Well, we didn't have quite that situation in Omaha, so we used the other device. One that one was developed and magnificently practiced by the Wobblies in the great free speech fights. You just bet the judge his jail isn't big enough to enforce the injunction. That's the way you do it. And on three separate occasions in that strike that went from September of 1938 to February of 1934, we had virtually the whole membership of the Omaha Truck Drivers Union in jail at one time. And it was untenable. Any time we defied the, the anti-picketing law, we did it as a block, as a block, hundreds and hundreds strong. They'd toss the, toss the membership in the pokey, and they'd come around, you know, with that tin plate with a little of that slum gullion on it, and a hot tin thing, and had something they called coffee that was left over from fumigating the cockroaches in the, in the warden's office. And the truck drivers would take this and they'd throw the slum on the floor and they'd start a tattoo on the cells with the plates and the cups. You, know. you could hear it all over downtown Ohio. It just became untenable. <laughs> meantime, meantime, 
we closed in by using the power of the other terminals. Until we got them narrowed down, the one last chance they had was in, uh, I'm not too far over to you that much. Uh, the last chance they had to break through in a serious way was in Omaha, and in Kansas City. So we called a conference of all the key figures in Omaha and the contiguous terminals to Kansas City. And you know, you get a bunch of over-the-road truck drivers together and there's not much that goes on in the industry, legal and illegal, that they don't know about. We had this council of war and, and we found every trick, every possible device the bosses could use to smuggle freight in and out through Kansas City to keep alive in Omaha while we had them strangled in other ways. And we got all the facts. We made a little map. Got one of these unmarked uh, county maps of the state that you can get if you go to the state highway department. And we marked it up with all kinds of symbols and lines and so on. All had real meaning to show exactly how we could lick the whole situation in the Missouri Valley if we clamped down on Omaha. We got a committee together and we went down and saw Tobin about it and asked his help. And he was impressed. He looks at this map, and that did it. He says, geez, just like a general. <laughs> <laughs> so he told us, <laughs> told us, all right, I'll back you. You go out there, and on you lay down the law to these Kansas City bosses. Don't strike them unless you have to. But if you have to strike them, I'll back you, and I'll pay strike benefits. Now, uh, formally, then, the, uh, the uh, as they still do, the Teamsters Union paid strike benefits. But uh, Tobin had it fixed up in the Constitution and bylaws, like these insurance policies you get, you know, as a bonus when you buy a, uh, a year's subscription to a newspaper. You've got to have a certain color necktie on, and you've got to be walking with the wind, not against the wind, when you get hit by a car crossing the street, or the policy's not good. And Tobin had the strike benefits set this way. So I told us, now, whatever you do, you go out there and you, he says, you know, you've got to follow the law. Well, I'll just make it short. It reminded me of a friendly vessel in wartime be given a chart to come in through the minefield into port without, without getting blown up on the way in. <laughs> he showed us exactly how we could work our way through all the clauses. We go out to Kansas City and we call all the bosses in. They come in. Oh, boy, were they caught. They thought they had us because in, uh, in uh, Kansas City and in St. Louis, two of the key terminals in Missouri were two of the figures among the old feudal barons that were dead against this thing, and they wanted no part of it because each of them had a little principality carved out. He had a nice little setup for himself in which he run everything with, a, with an iron hand, and the head of the, uh, the, head of the Teamsters set up in, uh, in Kansas City at that time was also a political lieutenant of what's the name of the joker that uh, was the political czar there for so long, Pendergast. The guy put all the concrete all over Kansas City in order to get a little uh, cut. Uh, they were dead against this whole thing, and they were, they were egging the bosses on to fight us. And the bosses thought they really had something. They were cocky. We walk into the meeting, and there's bosses there from everywhere. Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, Kentucky, Tennessee, southern Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, just that whole area. Anybody thought he might get touched the way this steamroller was was uh, going down the road. And they said, we, we'll do so and so and so and so and so, which was practically nothing. You can take it or leave it. So we said, well, we let, let us consult a minute. But we don't want to just give a yes or no answer to, uh, to your proposition for a settlement. We're following out Tobin's plan to get through the minefield. Well, this is about 10 o'clock in the morning. We say, can we have, say, till 4 o'clock in the afternoon? And uh, we go out of the room, go right to a phone in our room in the hotel, call Tobin, the boss has refused to sign. Don't do a thing now, he says, you get a wire from me. He says, I'll call the rest of the general executive board, and I'll wire you a ratification. I oh, told him, we've given the bosses at 4 o'clock before we give the answer. Good, I'll have the wire to the end before that. Sure enough, about 3 o'clock, we get a wire from Daniel J. Tobin authorizing a strike of all the over-the-road trucking concerns operating in and out of Kansas City with full strike benefits.
We come in at four o'clock, the boss is through there, talking to you and all We sit down in front of him. We don't say a word, we just flip the telegraph <laughs> across the table. And so they asked for a caucus. <laughs> they were out about 15 minutes, they come back in with a subcommittee of six. Said, we want to meet a subcommittee of yours, we want to sit down around the clock negotiations, and we guarantee you that the negotiations won't won't end even in a recess for sleep until we've had a settlement and we'll give you a fair settlement. And they gave us a fair settlement. They gave us what we wanted. This closed Omaha in to the point where finally the Omaha bosses capitulated. And with this, we brought everything to a new stage. We had fought the major war. We'd beaten out all the opposition in every respect. And we had proven that we could back up everything we had said we were going to do if the contract hadn't been signed here in the merchandise mart in the first place. And then we demonstrated the Eastern bosses that there was such a thing as retroactivity. We picked one of the biggest operators in the East. He runs out of Detroit and he runs all the way from New York City to Oklahoma City fanning out in all directions. And we'd had a we'd had a special detachment keeping a record on him while we're fighting out in the Missouri Valley. We had all the grievances, amounted to thousands of dollars in money he owed the drivers. We said, in a, first we give him the demands. He laughed. He thought this is funny as hell. We set a deadline right at a peak period in over-the-road trucking, prearranged signal, and at that hour, just all of a sudden, every wheel he had stopped between New York City and Oklahoma City, and they didn't turn again until we got the final report from the final business agent of the final local that every worker in that terminal received in his hand a check for the full settlement on the money the boss had cheated him out of by chiseling on the contract. And this demonstrated that it wasn't any class collaboration deal, and you can imagine what it did for the, for the morale of the, uh, of the truck drivers. In the course of the fight, a body of, uh, of uh, truck drivers out in the Sioux City area got framed up by the FBI. They claimed that these drivers picketing out on the highway had rolled a truck over. And so help me, the Federal Bureau of Investigation sent a big surveying detachment out and went through a long process of surveying, studying the legal maps and everything in order to make a case to prove that the truck had been stopped on the Iowa side of the line and rolled over onto the Minnesota side of the line, which made it interstate commerce and gave the federal government jurisdiction. They brought these men to trial under the Mann Act. Now, the Mann Act is for stealing vehicles. And, uh, or no, not the Mann Act, no. Uh, the Dyer Act, the Dyer Act. <laughs> Once in a while we had a truck driver who had a grievance over the Mann Act and needed a little legal help. <laughs> the Dyer Act, you know, for, for stealing a vehicle and transporting it across state lines. Uh, one of the significant things is that the whole area, from Michigan across to Colorado and from Minnesota and North Dakota down into Oklahoma and Arkansas and Texas, Local after local stood in absolute solidarity with those men, and when they were convicted and the judge tried to, tried to uh, order them sent to the state penitentiary that very night if we didn't make, make $15,000 in cash bond for them, all over the area, the local secretary treasurer just went out and dipped into the treasury and started wiring money into Sioux City. And just before the deadline, uh, we were able to walk over to the federal clerk and lay 15,000 iron men on the line and take these workers out of the county jail and save them from being in the federal penitentiary the next morning. Fought the thing, appealed it. In the end, it stuck, and they had to do a two-year hitch in the penitentiary. But it's a little, a little sidelight that gives you some feeling of the kind of battles that went on in that period and the kind of solidarity that can be generated on a far wider, more amorphous area now dealing with this, with this whole 11 state area that I, I'm speaking of than was the case in, in Minneapolis. Now we consolidated then the over the road 
organization with the renewal of the contract a year later in the late summer, early fall of 1939, in which another big improvement was made in conditions. We tightened up all the way up and down the line on the contract from the point of view of the concepts of union control on the job and arrived at a definitive stage in the development of the over-the-road structure and its imposition on the bosses under union control and under union power with the unqualified rate to strike that represented the definitive shadow of the old craft union structure of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and that opened the way to the growth to the present stage and potential power of the Teamsters Union. We weren't able to carry on from there. We had to leave it at that point because something else was happening. While we were consolidating the over-the-road victory, and preparing a tightly knit setup, World War II started. Hitler invaded Poland, and Roosevelt, who had made his quarantine the aggressor speech in 1938, began preparing for American intervention in the Second World War. At the same time, the radicalization was ebbing because it had not passed beyond the union level to the political level and the price is already being paid even though there were, was a recession in 1939 that was closely comparable in its depths to the recession the, in, the, in the earlier part of the 30s. The bureaucracies were becoming re-entrenched in the unions a new form now with the rise of the CIO and these trends signaled a reversal of the favorable objective conditions that had operated to our benefit in the earlier 30s. And this led soon to a new controversy with Tobin and the question of war policy was at the heart of the conflict. Tobin was already then, in 1939, playing the role of a bellwether for Roosevelt. You know what a bellwether is? That, you know what they call them in the stockyards, the Judas goat, you know, that leads the other animals up the ramp to the slaughtering pen, and then he goes on by, and the other animals go in, and they come roasts and chops and one thing or another. Tobin was playing the role of the bellwether to help dra dragoon the workers into the ranks of the imperialist army for World War II. He was writing editorials in the journal, militant editorials calling for the United States to get into the war against Hitler, and beginning to seek to impose this line on the Union. We sought to avoid any unnecessary friction with Tobin in this regard, but there could be no compromise on the fundamental questions of principle involved. And in this situation, the reversal of the objective trends was beginning to embolden the reactionaries and the opportunists throughout the Union, including the Teamsters Union, and it was even having certain effects in Local 574, particularly among people who had come into the Union after the strike battles and who were more reaping the benefits of the struggle that had been fought than being contributing members to everything that had been created. And in Local 574, long well into 1940, they set up a phony committee of 100 inside the Union, bowdlerizing, desecrating, if I may use the expression to call it by a more appropriate name, crapping on 
that magnificent body of 100 fighters that had been the broad general staff of the strikes in 1934 that I described to you last night, trying to make capital out of this concept for an utterly reactionary purpose. They were helped and encouraged in this by the FBI, which had been keeping dossiers on the leaders in the main militants in 574 and was feeding information to these pinks and phonies of a red, uh, you know, material for red baiting attacks that they could use inside the Union. And the local AFL bureaucrats were getting into the act. Until it came to the point that Tobin decided he had to do something. Now I mean, he decided he had to do something. I think you can understand why Tobin wasn't exactly spoiling to get into another fight with us. We'd had quite a few brushes. And he hadn't done any too good. He didn't want another showdown fight with local 544 if he could avoid it. He didn't want it. He wanted to avoid it. For one thing, he was uncertain as to how deeply the International Brotherhood of Teamsters as a whole would be affected. Because we weren't without some support and following throughout the Teamsters Union, particularly after this two-year struggle for the establishment of the over-the-road set up. But nevertheless, Tobin was prepared to subordinate the Union considerations to his collaboration with Roosevelt. He began by making overtures for a compromise arrangement with the leadership of 544. He proposed to establish what you might have termed in the light of its opening conception of a benevolent receivership. A receivership, as you know, in a union is a device used by the international unions to send a representative in to take charge of the local and abrogate all democratic powers of decision in the local and arrogate to the receiver, who is the representative of the general president of the international and takes orders only from him, all powers of decision. What Tobin proposed was a receivership in which the local would be given a maximum of leeway, but we would have to accept a receiver who would have the power of veto if we insisted on doing something that the international felt couldn't be tolerated. And of course, the whole thing hinged on the war question. Now, we couldn't accept any such arrangement.